Hello, I'm Rodney Williams, CEO of Listener, serial innovator with over 17 patents under my name. There are a few moments in time where you get to experience a technology that could change everything. This is one of those moments. Welcome to what we call the new internet, the internet of sound. Now, it's a new standard that we created, launched, and is about to get a whole lot more powerful. This all started with my frustration with technology. Technology, products, services, and experiences are created based on the limitations of technology versus the optimal consumer experience. It's an issue. It's the reason why you can buy a $100,000 Tesla and still have an issue. You still have a key fob. It's the reason why you, can, you have to uh, still use a ticket. I'm having a little problem with my, my clicker. So let's start over. My frustration is here. The fact that you can still buy a $100,000 Tesla and use a key fob. Or regardless of how expensive the car may be, you still have to connect with the phone. And that can be tedious. Or this paper ticket, a technology that hasn't changed in over 30 years. We're still lining up and trying to gain access with the barcode. Now, this is all based on limitations of technology, really, really old technology, driven by these protocols. So when you think of these protocols, they're limited range, connectivity, and they're often restrictive based on hardware. We use sound to supplement and make those connections better. We actually send data over audio, silent audio, just above the human hearing level, unlocking the power of data over audio. Quite simple, but incredibly powerful. As the world's most advanced ultrasonic technology, we send data over audio. We sell data over audio as a service per device per year. This year alone, we're on pace to power over 30 million devices. One of the industries that we're disrupting is the ticketing industry. Ticketing companies have chosen us as their mobile authentication tool. Simply put, identifying your mobile device, then having authentication for the moment of access. We're actually live today in a number of venues with astonishing results. 0% fraud, 100% attendees identified, and entry times in less than a second. I'm actually going to show an example of this right now on stage. If I can get a camera to my iPad. Now, simply put, this current iPad is sitting in airplane mode. And sorry, guys. This device, if you can hold it up for me, is sitting in airplane mode. It's going to detect me as I approach that device. This is an example of ultrasonic data transmission. Now, in that case, it just recognized my name. But it could be anything. It could be an ID, it could be a password, it could be a link. What you saw was ultrasonic data transmission in a live environment. Now, what you saw is a smart tone being created, encoded with a small packet of data, then broadcasted, decoded, and demodulated from the receiving device, happening completely local. Both devices were actually in airplane mode. We transmit data essentially four key ways. Audio to mobile devices, like playing silently or being embedded into broadcast television, mobile to mobile, or mobile to any device, like the ticket, or even driving point of sale transactions. We can even be embedded and enabled in a device, like a car or allow in-car connectivity, whether you're inside the car or outside the car. There's no other protocol as simple, as flexible, or as powerful as listener. We send more data across more devices than any other technology, audio technology in the market, 14 times that our closest competitor. And let's just focus on Google. It only works on Android devices. Kind of defeats the purpose, not to mention we're just better. Now, when you look at our market opportunity, we span across the connected world, powering in venue, in car, and at home, enabling solutions for proximity-based messaging, identification to authentication, 
to being the gateway in the connected world. And we're well on our way. Our market opportunity to some of that spans across the biggest markets in the world and sits well above $50 billion. And we're on our way. As we've partnered, tested, and even been awarded by the best companies in the world as the next generation protocol. Now, we've reached innovation that technologists around the world thought were impossible. We did this by focusing on identifying and connecting devices better. We are leading and pioneering the internet of sound. And today, I'm excited to announce our global commercial deployment. We welcome builders, creators across the Internet of Things that join our pursuit. Judges, audience, viewers, we're here now, and thank you. All right, Stone, please uh, click again. Um, great job. I, like, maybe this is a burning question for a lot of people in the crowd. Um, what have you figured out that Klinkle didn't figure out after burning through $30 million? Well, I, we have customers. Um, ah. <laughs> I, I guess that matters, yeah. Different. So I think that has to do with a working product and a, and a team headquartered in Cincinnati, Ohio that are a bunch of badasses. <laughs> Thank you. Um, just uh, beyond sort of like just actual device recognition or association, what, the, what are the longer term, what longer term functionality do you believe that you'll be able to enable? Yeah, when you think about our data throughput, which today um, we have testers using up to 1,000 bits per second, uh, we can encrypt that data and have action oriented. Um, so at first it's data identification, but we will be able to transmit small files, passwords, or really, really encrypted based messages across audio. Um, the theoretical limit for our technology is actually two megabytes. Um, one of our projects is actually we're deploying sound networks in Africa alongside MTN, um, which is a, it's a telecom, providing connectivity in places where connectivity is really hard. And it, it, it might, might have been just been on the stage here, but what, what type of latency and distance limitations do you have? Well, uh, detection um, depends on the data packet. Uh, range is a product of volume, so the louder the speaker or the volume, et cetera. You know, my demo wasn't quite as planned, right? I needed my camera, everything wasn't worked. But, I mean, we are 100% reliable within a second or two, uh, even though detection can happen as fast as a few point, you know, point 0.1 seconds. Rodney, I love that you did a live demo on the stage, especially in something with this kind of audio, so, and that it worked. I mean, congratulations, that was awesome to you guys. Um, I'm curious about how you think about deployment, like what, when you get a new customer, does it have to be embedded when they're building the app? Like, what's, what's the way that you'll get embedded and become the standard of choice? Well, that is our challenge, right? Uh, we are an ingredient. Um, so we power other devices or services. Um, with that said, uh, we've created an extremely horizontal technology, API and SDK, that our customers can intake, enable, and use as they choose fit. And we're working with some of the best companies to do so. I think, on the, on the other hand, strategically, we've made a go-to-market decision to partner with chipset manufacturers and hardware companies, like DSPG, like Intel. And we are being uh, embedded into the firmware of that device to provide additional security as a next-generation protocol. Got it. So if you aren't already embedded, right, right now, so if someone has your SDK or is using your API, what are the requirements on the actual device for it to work? I mean, how, how broadly applicable can it be? So we can work on any device. We're just software. Today we live in the application level. Okay. But we can live in websites. Uh, we can be deployed as a link. You know, broadcasting audio is one of the basic things that the device can do. So from an from a integration standpoint, we're extremely scalable, whether we're sitting in an application or we're sending in a link that's being broadcasting our audio. How are you thinking about um, challenges like man in the middle attacks, phishing, um, or broader privacy implications? Yeah, so it's one of the reasons that separates our technology versus every other competitor. We actually architect it very similar to the other protocols where there's a preamble, there's a header, and there's a payload. And then we have the ability to profile. So once it hears our preamble, the header has all security-like functions whether it's time, whether it's token, whether it's matching API keys. And then the, the data is actually decoded and demodulated. What that means is if you were to record or try to do some type of phishing attack, the timestamp and the tokens would not ever match, and the data would never actually demodulate. Um, so we've built it thinking about powering the real world, not a very, very singular use case. We've also bypassed interference. 
by creating multiple channels, where it modulates actually as it's developed and created in real time, so that uh, allows it not to have interference. <laughs> Pick, piggybacking on that, when, when you have a high density you know, uh, um, area, whether it be a concert or, and you have many people using this, yeah, well, noise interference, but also people using the same thing, right? So how, how do you uh, scale it, essentially? Yeah, we don't have interference. You know, where we launched or where we initially began a lot of our testing is actually single directional use cases. We were in stadiums like the Cleveland Cavaliers and the Colts um, driving single connectivity. Now, as we made the technology better, we allowed the technology to talk back, maintaining that same reliability that we initially launched. Um, it has a lot to do with our uh, error correction. To be where we have the most challenges is actually reverb. That's echo. Yeah. So crowd noise and other noise doesn't affect us. Reverb, which think of buildings of concrete floors and high glass windows, has a lot of echo. And the technology still has to determine what's the proper message versus the incorrect message. And uh, when that, that's our worst case scenario. Um, so we tend to work good in environments like this. <laughs> that one more. Go ahead, Sonny. Um, so digging in a little bit more on the privacy question, um, I don't have a lot of depth on this space, but uh, I know that there were recent rumblings of feathers around um, advertisers using no, you know, uh, high frequency uh, sound detection to track people. Um, and so there is some landscape. I'd love to hear about you know, how you think about the competitive landscape. Um, but then two, right, do you uh, potentially become a platform for very intrusive people tracking? Well, those are considered beacons, um, beacon providers, and that's their business model is audience measurement. They actually can't transmit real-time data. Um, that's just not our business model and not what we do. Um, we just don't believe it. My background is I'm a P&G marketer. I was actually a brand manager for Pampers. Uh, and I believed in better connectivity, and to me, it was about sending a, a dad the proper message as he stood in front of a diaper, not necessarily tracking him for all of the things you could track him for. Um, so when we designed this technology, we designed it to create better experiences, not to track consumers based on where they are. Um, that's what our aha moment was that we can actually hide a significant amount of data and provide something that has never been created before. All right, we are out of time, so give it up for listener, Internet of Sound.